thank you very much for the introduction and uh, thanks for the opportunity to uh, uh, to speak here. So, uh, as said by Ralph, uh, uh, the next 25 minutes or so, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, small molecule uh, uh <coughs> drug identification, metabolite identification, which we do, which is most of the work that we do in the uh, in the group I'm working in uh, at Janssen Pharmaceutica in uh, Belgium. Um, yeah. Yeah, if it works. Okay. So this is uh, the contents of my talk. First, uh, a small introduction of the group I'm working in and kind of work that we're doing. Uh, then um, something about the compound discoverer workflow that we use uh, for the MET-ID work that we do. Then I'd like to uh, take a deeper dive into the, the pattern scoring mode uh, note, which is one of my uh, favorite notes in compound discoverer. It's turned out to be very useful for our work. Um, a small word about how we filter our data to find our hits in Compound Discoverer and uh, different strategies uh, that we use to obtain our MS2 or MSN uh, data. And then uh, finally, uh, our Compound Discoverer wish list. Uh, I was very lucky to be in the, let's say, the, the beta testing team for, for Compound Discoverer 3.0. And then, of course, you try to find uh, things that could still improve or so in that way the wish list is kind of developing its, itself and sometimes I feel a bit spoiled because the software is so nice already and then we're asking more and more features even uh, already very happy with the software as it is but it can always be, be improved so my long list at the end please <laughs> take it in a positive way it's just to, to make the great software even better so a uh, small introduction to our uh, uh, group. So um, we have uh, seven people, uh, lab staff, working on uh, uh, small molecule drug uh, med idea. And uh, the equipment here we use, it's um, high resolution mass specs mainly from, uh, from Waters, the, the Synapse uh, family. We've got one Synapse G2 and two G2Ss. And we have uh, three uh, orbit traps. Uh, one of the, the first ones, uh, a, a classic that we kind of upgraded to be more or less an XL. Turbit, an Orbitab Elite, which we bought with a developer's kit so we can go up to 480k resolution. So that's really nice for isotopic fine structures. And uh, a Thermo Q Executive Classic. And we've got a 2D prep system for uh, isolation of metabolites for, for, for NMR. So um, most of our systems are equipped with the option for large volume injections uh, because your mass spec detector is really sensitive but the radioactive detector uh, typically is not so for that purpose you want to put a lot of sample in your system to also get a decent radioactivity uh, signal out of it so we have both online radio detection and also we can fractionate and do an offline counting which is uh, more, more more sensitive but more laboratory laborious for the for radioactive work Talking about the studies, we're working end-to-end, -end, so all the way from discovery up to development. We're doing in vitro studies uh, in microsomes, hepatocytes, also doing in vivo studies, both preclinical, clinical, uh, both radioactive and non-radioactive. And for clinical, we're in the area of uh, the, uh, the missed coverage, so at the first stage, the, the first in human study where you need to find the metabolites that are more than uh, 10% of truculated material in plasma, uh, <coughs> and then all the way up to the human radioactive mass balance study. Sometimes we do it with micro traces, and then we use accelerated mass spectrometry. We typically outsource, of course, that type of work because we don't have an AMS uh, in house. But so that's that's uh, our group. Um, this is one of the instruments is that's our Orbitrap Elite uh, with online radio detection and UV detection and. Uh, then I zoom in here on the auto sampler where you can see the, uh, the part where we can do the really large volume injections and we pre-concentrate on a trapping column and then send it to the analytical column. And in that way we can get down to very low, uh, very high sensitivities in uh, DPM per ml. So here we, it's an example where we injected 72 mils of urine in our, uh, in our sample. I think that's not the sample volumes that people <laughs> typically use, but Usually we go much lower, but that's th this is what we can do if it's if it's really uh, uh, necessary. Um, now this was a talk about uh, compound discoverer, so let's get into that. 
um, and start with our workflow. So yeah, we tried several things, but we finally ended up more or less with uh, one of the standard workflows offered by uh, uh, Turbo. It's actually quite good. So for us, it's a combination of the expected and the unknown workflow. Uh, we know our drug molecule, so that's very nice. You can put that in and it can uh, predict what kind of phase one and phase two metabolites you can uh, get and you get a very nice listing of uh, expected metabolites but of course we also want to look in an unbiased uh, way for unexpected metabolites so we combine it with the unknown uh, workflow and we only changed a couple of things we just removed removed a few um, nodes that we that we normally don't uh, don't use and this is how the whole uh, workflow is is uh, is looking um, so I must say, uh, I think a big pro of, of term, the, the Compound Discover software is that there are so many parameters that you can uh, vary and optimize and, and tweak and you can uh, make your own uh, workflows. That's, that's really good, but it can also be a bit maybe frightening at the beginning for, for uh, users that are not really accustomed to working with the software. So what we did is um, we prepared a document explaining each and every node with the standard parameters in there and, and uh, make a small, and we made this table listing all the nodes where you need to have a look at before starting your processing. So then you end up with a kind of short list of parameters that you need to check and maybe modify. Um, so then it's, it's just easier to use also for, for less uh, experienced users. Um, then to the pattern scoring node, so as I said, one of the one of my favorites. Um, so, for the people who don't use this note a lot, what it actually does is it, it's looking at the, the isotopic uh, uh, distribution, and it can uh, uh, filter on that. So, if if you have a really an atypical uh, isotopic uh, distribution, you can very very easily f fish out these uh, your, your hits. So. Um, we use it a lot, for instance, uh, if we have uh, a radioactive study, um, for instance, for in vitro studies, I always try to stimulate people to use a, a one over one ratio of carbon 12 and carbon 14 labeled uh, material, because you then get a very nice ratio, uh, one over one of the both isotopes. And then uh, you can very nice filter on these data using the pattern scoring node. So you need to enter the uh, the mass difference and uh, there you have a mass tolerance that you can put in and you can put that really very tight because you're looking at the data within one in the same spectrum so the mass the relative mass accuracy between these two isotopes is yeah that's really good so so we typically put that at, at one millidalton or something and then you have the 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 ratio of the of the peaks the intensity tolerance standard that's 30 percent so the 30 percent it's actually that means plus or minus 30%, which is quite broad, so you can even tighten uh, uh, that. So uh, this note works very well, but the um, disadvantage is that uh, it always looks for the first isotope first. So if your first isotope has a low abundance, uh, for instance, if we incubate our in vitro samples with pure radioactive, which then in practice is 95% carbon-14, 5% carbon-12, then it's looking at that tiny peak first, so you need to put your threshold really low uh, for the software to be able to, to find your hits, so that then we really miss uh, hits. So it would be nice if uh, the software could look at the largest isotope first and then look for the, for the other ones. That, that would make it work even better than it does uh, already. Um, you can also use it, oh, uh, this is <laughs> an example of a uh, in the top you see the, the, the radioactive trace of an, of an uh, in vitro incubate and at the bottom you can see the, the summed extracted iron chromatogram of all the peaks that gave me uh, the, the, the hit on the carbon-12, carbon-14 isotope pattern. So you see a really nice match. So I think we didn't miss too many metabolites using this approach. Uh, <coughs> another application is for instance looking at uh, reactive metabolite trapping. So uh, that for instance with uh, uh, with glutathione, so you're looking at which, um, if, if, uh, if your drug is reacting with glutathione, re resulting in glutathione uh, conjugates, you want to, that, that's for us very important to know, particularly in an early stage, in, in drug discovery stage, where you um, don't want to see uh, reactive metabolites, so, so 
you don't want to see any glutathione adducts, for instance. So you can then um, modify your molecule uh, chemical structure to, to make sure that, that the glutathione conjugates are not being formed or to a lesser extent. Um, so uh, for that, you can use a, a mixture of, of uh, unlabeled and stable isotope labeled glutathione, uh, carbon 13, 2, 15, nitrogen 1, and then filter on the mass difference of, of 3.00, etc. Uh, so that also works uh, quite well. Uh, well, we mainly use our Synergy 2S in drug discovery, so we don't, uh, we have only limited experience with, with this approach on, on the Q-executive and red compound discoverer, but uh, the data that, that I did gather looked very, very good, and I have the feeling that probably we, we don't have too many uh, false negatives and, and false positives, maybe, maybe virtually none. So that's, that's really, uh, really an advantage that you get a list and you can trust on it and you don't need to uh, manually uh, kick out uh, for false positives. So it works really, really nice. Uh, so how do I typically filter my data to find <coughs> the hits? Well, it's not very fancy, but, but um, I must say this, this ratio filter that you have, uh, so you can, can look at the ratio between your sample and blank. There are some competitor software on the market where you need to uh, put in the, the ratio that you want to filter on prior to processing, so you only have one one ratio and you cannot play around with uh, with that and uh, for me it's a big advantage that in this software package you can uh, change your ratio and then filter again so what I typically do is I start with a rather large ratio between sample and blank maybe a factor of 20 or 50 then you already f uh, fish out the, the the hits that are probably real real hits because they're really distinct from your your background uh, and then later on you can go deeper and look at maybe a ratio of only a factor of three between sample and blank, but then obviously, obviously you, you will have more uh, false, false positives that then, and then it's more work to go through the data. And we often com uh, combine this with an, the area max filter. We typically look at the, the peak area of our parent drug and then we want to go down to, for instance, 1% or 0.1% of the parent drug. Um, and then you can combine these filters. And of course, if you have the pattern match filter as well, uh, then <coughs> you can put that in uh, uh, too. Yeah, this is what I also sometimes uh, do. This is an example of, uh, I think, an in vivo study where we have plasma samples at different uh, time points, and you can have a look at the data and see if there's a kind of a pharmacokinetics profile in there that really gives you additional confidence that this is really a drug-related uh, um, hit. So you can just manually look at the how the peak area changes with uh, time point, but, but you could also make a separate ratio filter out of that if you expect that, for instance, at 24 hours post-dose, your signal is much lower than at two hours post-dose, you just make a ratio filter of the two hour over 24 hour sample and uh, then you can uh, filter on that. So that's also uh, uh, kind of useful. So um, we use different strategies to obtain our uh, MS2 or MSN spectra. I've listed four possibilities here, and I go over them one by one. The first one is a complete MET, MET ID uh, based on the full MS data. You do full MS data first, and then later on, uh, you select uh, the MS2s that you need to run, and then you run them preferably in the in the PRM mode. Then some smart scanning techniques that I will show in a minute. Acquire X is of course very interesting now and MS2 triggered by uh, compound discoverer processing. So the first one, um, this is really good because it gives very high quality MS2 and MSM uh, data if we run it in, in PRM. So sometimes we're, we don't always have a very, very abundant peak. Sometimes we're looking at very minor metabolites. So we have a lot of background there and it's really important to distinguish the uh, the MS2 peaks related to our uh, metabolite from the, from the background. And if you run your MS2 all the time or at your retention time, plus or minus one minute, for instance, uh, then you can subtract the beginning and end of your peak from the middle of the peak and get rid of a lot of background and get a better quality uh, MS2 or MSN spectrum. So 
<coughs> that's uh, what we often do. The disadvantage is, of course, it's time consuming because you need to uh, do re-injections in PRM mode and you can miss MS2s uh, if you're not initially identified the metabolite and later on you identify it and you need to go back and run again another injection. Um, then you can think of some smart scanning techniques. And act actually, it was uh, Vincent Jespers who used to work with uh, uh, Thermo, um, now working uh, at, at Janssen Pharmaceutica, and uh, had a lot of interesting discussions with him about compound discoverer. So he pointed my attention to these two possibilities. You can just do a full MS and then a data-dependent MS2. And if you, um, let's say, tweak your parameters right, uh, with, a, for instance, a top five and a good apex triggering, so you have your MS2 triggered nicely at the top of your peak. In combination with some dynamic exclusion, you, you already get quite a lot of uh, MS2s. And you can b combine it, for instance, with an all ion fragmentation, uh, so you still get some MS2 data on, on the stuff that hasn't triggered uh, on the data dependent. <coughs> and at the bottom of the slide, you see also an interesting one, the neutral loss triggered data dependent MS2. So if you know uh, the fragment ions of your parent drug, you can rationalize uh, uh, neutral losses that are probably, that are related to your drug and probably to metabolites, put them in, and then you really get relevant uh, data dependent MS2s. And then it was ASMS 2018 and we got Acquire X. So if you buy a nice new uh, Tribrid Orbit Trap uh, IDX, I think it comes with Acquire X, which is really neat, I think. So what it does is for people who don't, haven't seen this yet, it injects a, a blank sample, uh, a, bl a blank and a sample. And then from the blank, it's generating an exclusion list from the sample and inclusion list and then based on these lists it's doing MSN with a new injection. Every, every MSN that has triggered is put on an exclusion list and then uh, re-injections are done as long uh, until all the hits on the list on the inclusion list have been covered. So that's really nice. Only one disadvantage not available for QX active at least not yet, maybe for Christmas. But uh, <laughs> So I thought maybe <laughs> we can do something that is coming maybe a little bit close to this, or, or um, I thought, what can Compound Discoverer do, uh, do for us? So um, I tried the same thing, inject the blank, inject the sample, but then uh, process these <coughs> together and then make an inclu inclusion list based on the ratio of the, the intensity sample over blank, if that's larger than a certain value x, uh, then make an uh, inclusion list. You can automatically export this inclusion list from Compound Discoverer and import it in QExective. And it gives you the, 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 the masses to trigger with, with, with retention time window, so you get kind of PRM data. So, so you can later do the background uh, subtraction if you like, so uh, that's, that's really neat. Then you can... Um, process these, these three samples together, then it's important that, you, that the third sample, the full MS plus data dependent MS2, you add as an identification only sample. So then you don't get additional hits, you get exactly the same hits, but then for the hits where you got the MS2, you get this nice light MS2. And you can filter on that and then make a new list uh, consisting of uh, yeah, sample over blank, larger than X and MS2, not triggered yet, and you can do an injection again. So you can you can do that. It's, uh, this processing took 49 minutes, I think. The second processing, 70 minutes, so there's some waiting time. But yeah, you can complete the whole process uh, in a day, depending on how many iterations you want to do, of course. Uh, but uh, that, that's something you, uh, uh, you can do. Um, then our compound discoverer uh, wish list. <laughs> so there are different items here from small nice to have to, to, to bigger things. Uh, a small thing is a back button in the uh, would be nice if you want to can if you want to cancel your last action. Oh, what I did what did I do? Let's go back. That could be convenient. Um, there's nothing in compound discovery yet on peptides. 
uh, metabolite identification. It's not that we do that a lot, but yeah, it would be a nice feature, but maybe easier to, to ask than to program it. Uh, then the, the fish scoring works really nice for us, but still uh, there can be some fragment ions that are not, that the fish scoring is not able to, to identify. And maybe that's more often the case in negative ion and in positive ion. Uh, so it would be nice if, if uh, another scoring algorithm could also be included in compound discoverer so you could toggle uh, between, between the two or maybe it can indicate with different colors from uh, which, which uh, scoring system is identifying which um, metabolite. So that would also be a nice one. We now do this uh, manually by, by entering our MS2 data in a, in a software package and then we get an alternative identification of the fragments but it would be nice if that could be included in compound discoverer uh, possibility to filter on the presence of certain ms2 ions or neutral losses could be useful if you have your uh, ms2 spectrum of your drug then you can think about uh, relevant ms2 ions and, and neutral loss ions and then if, if compound discoverer then can indicate uh, the number of relevant ions that it found and you can also filter on that it gives you additional confidence that you're looking at the at the real uh, uh, hit um, the next bullet we already discussed i think earlier today possibility for pausing a job and resuming it at a late, later stage for instance the next day could be nice if you're for instance processing on a laptop and then you want to go home but you have 62 hours of processing time then you need to leave your laptop at work or yeah, well, you can just shut it down, but then you can start all over again. So uh, a resume button would be would be nice. Um, let me go on, <laughs> but this is my last <laughs> slide. <laughs> um, when I start my processing, I, um, it's very often that I forget to put my, my structure in my library. So then I do that, and then I need to close down Compound Discoverer and open it up again because when you enter it in the library, it's not immediately accessible. So it would be nice if it would be possible to make that immediately accessible. Uh, then removal of background ions in MS2 spectra, as I mentioned, can be interesting to subtract beginning and end of the peak from the middle to, to uh, really see the, the MS2 ions that are related to your hit and not to the background. Or maybe you could apply a, a mass effect filtering on your MS2 data and get rid of some background ions. So just some thoughts if, if that would be possible. Um, then um, you can do targeted MS2 or you can do all ion fragmentation. You can also do something uh, in between. Uh, at AB Sykes they call it uh, SWOT analysis and on, on the Q-executive you can do data independent analysis you can uh, what it basically does is uh, you can select different uh, mass windows for instance 20 dot on white and do a fragmentation on that so you get the quality of a spectrum which is somewhere in between data dependent ms2 and online fragmentation uh, so it would be nice if these types of data sets could be compatible with, with compound discoverer because you get quite a lot of uh, dia windows uh, if you want to cover a range of 500 dalton with 20 Dalton windows, you get uh, quite some, quite some uh, uh, data. And as far as I know, that can now not work in Compound Discoverer, but maybe I'm wrong. The pattern scoring node um, would be nice there too, if you can work with different intensity tolerances for different uh, ratios. Eh? You can put in uh, multiple filters in one node, but maybe you want to have different uh, intensity tolerances uh, for for each of the of the of the patterns you put in, right now you cannot do that. Would be nice if the software can look for the most abundant isotope first, and if it could take into account multiple charged ions, with its, which it currently uh, uh, doesn't. But <laughs> I'm still very happy with Cobalt Discoverer software. This is just my dream to make it even uh, even better. Uh, I'd like to thank some people from uh, uh, the group I'm working in. My uh, my boss Philip Kuykens and some uh, colleagues that are also working uh, with the compound discoverer software and Vincent Jespers for the interesting discussions we had and uh, 
Caroline Ding from Thermo for the opportunity to uh, to speak here because she asked me to and uh, to do that and also for the opportunity to be in the test team for Compound Discoverer 3.0. And thank you for your attention. Thanks.